All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so last talk before lunch is telling you about one of the near-term plans for uh, improving the quality of general torsions in the force field um, and uh, how this involves all of the different working parts that we've been assembling uh, over the last year. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, we're going to trade off between a few people here because a lot of people have contributed to this uh, and only some of them are mentioned here on the slide. Um, the, the basic idea is that um, we're going to take sets of molecules that hopefully are representative of the space that we would like to perform well on, um, uh, enumerate the different protonation tautomeric states that are relevant, uh, fragment them in some useful way uh, that gives us one dimensional and two dimensional torsion drive capability for them by looking at both individual bond rotations and, and couplings between them. And um, the thing will tell us more about why that's important and how he's able to actually uh, do this to achieve high accuracies in his last force fields. Um, we'll generate these in, uh, torsion scans using high level QM in parallel and deposit them in an open database that Daniel Smith at MOLSI will tell us about, um, both the workflows for doing that and the, the public database QC archive that he's been engineering as part of a larger effort that we've been very lucky to synergize with. And then we'll fit these first generation, of course, will be with force balance, second generation, maybe with Bayesian methods that Haya has been working on. Um, and then there's a lot of different uh, pieces of code uh, that we've been working on to pull all of this together. So I'm going to go ahead and yield uh, to uh, Li Ping to tell us more about um, why we're driving one and two dimensional torsions and what the tools involved in this are. Um, all right. Uh, th uh, thank you, John. So I will only, uh, so I will only speak for a, um, for a pretty short time about um, um, about some subcomponents of the subproject. Um, as you'll see, this will this involves a uh, uh, multiple interrelated software tools. Um, and the um, and the part that all um, that I'd like to report progress on that we kind of achieved in the last year is um, um, is the is the following task. So um, so the task says, given a molecule initial confirmation on a quantum calculation specification and n selected torsions to drive produce an n-dimensional potential energy profile where torsions are constrained along a specified grid and orthogonal degrees of freedom are minimized to the fullest extent possible. Now, um, I should be clear that this really is, uh, sorry? Closer. Closer, okay, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, um, this, uh, this okay? Okay, yeah, so I, so I should mention that this really is kind of a sub-problem in, um, in, the, in the larger problem because if you want to generate a lot of uh, high quality torsion data, you have to also identify which, um, like, you know, which degrees of freedom to drive, which is also a, a very difficult problem that, um, um, that, that Haya will be telling us about a little bit later. So, um, but this first part was achieved through a combination of open source tools that I will uh, briefly tell you about. Um, so, first, uh, so first is a tool called Geometric. This is an open source tool for geometry optimization. This actually, um, seems very similar to the force balance that I already told you about. Um, instead of optimizing force field parameters, we're now optimizing geometries. And this code talks to quantum chemistry codes to, um, by passing them the Cartesian coordinates and getting the, and getting the gradients in the, getting the energies and the gradients in Cartesian coordinates from the quantum chemistry code. Um, geometric itself implements several internal coordinate systems and determines the internal coordinate steps and take steps to ensure that all of the constraints that you specify are satisfied along the, um, in the course of the minimization and so on. Um, and this code really was written to implement a new coordinate system called translation rotation internal coordinates with the, um, with the design goal of being efficient at optimizing things like water clusters and supramolecular complexes. That's not directly relevant to torsion drives, but that's why this software was written in the first place. And you can see that the performance is better than other uh, um, than several other codes and other coordinate systems. Okay, so um, so we are going to be relying on geometric as sort of a low level tool, and the quantum chemistry code like Sci4 is the even lower level tool that geometric is calling to obtain the energies and gradients at a given level of theory. Um, sitting one level higher than geometric is a tool called torsion drive, and torsion drive. Um, torsion drive generates this um, generates this grid of constrained um, energy minimizations through this idea of wavefront propagation. So this figure here is supposed to illustrate the difference um, between what I would call a, uni a unidirectional um, um, scan of constrained minimizations and the wavefront propagation. So imagine if um, 
sorry. Um, imagine if you had a starting geometry that may, may be at this corner in the grid, and you wanted to generate a grid of two-dimensional minimized structures. You might pick a leading dimension and a trailing dimension in which, you know, in the leading dimension, you, 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 optimize, um, you, you optimize along these values, keeping the other value constrained. And then once you, and then for every one of these values that you optimize, then you, then you start new optimizations in the trailing dimension. That's what I, that's what um, I'm referring to as a unidirectional scan. Whereas in this other wavefront pop propagation idea, you start with an initial point, you start optimizations at all of the nearest at the nearest neighbor grid points, and then at the nearest neighbor grid points, you repeat the cycle again. And in this process of wavefront pop propagation, you will end up starting new optimizations at grid points where you already have minimized energies, but because you have changed the initial conditions of the minimization, you might pick up on new local minima. And this, in this wavefront propagation, you repeat it recursively until, um, until you end up with a complete surface. And the advantages of using the wavefront propagation is that, um, is that you end up, in general, with lower energy structures. Um, it, is, uh, um, it is more robust in terms, that, in terms of if you have a starting structure, you, um, you, you will, you're guaranteed to end up with a certain potential surface, whereas in the unidirectional scan, it's going to depend on the scan direction that you choose, as well as your choice of leading and trailing dimensions. Um, and if we are running these optimizations in a distributed manner, which QC Archive is doing, you may actually be able to achieve the wavefront propagation results in less wall time, because, um, because these optimizations are launched in, in waves, you can actually end up with a converged result with, um, with, with fewer sets of optimizations compared to the unidirectional case, even though the total number of optimizations is larger. Okay? The total number of optimizations in the wavefront propagation is, in this case, is four times the number of grid points, whereas in the left case, it's just the number of grid points. So you pay a factor of four in terms of computational cost, but you get these benefits uh, that I've listed on the right. Um, and here are some examples with uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional torsion drives. Um, this is a modified version of a molecule that, uh, that Haya provided, and we carried out a unidirectional scan as well as, um, as well as a torsion drive scan shown in your two panels here. And the blue curves indicate the potential energy of the minimized structure, and the orange curve indicates the number of optimization steps needed to reach a minimum. So don't really worry about the jaggedness of the orange curve. That just shows you how many steps the algorithm needs to reach a minimum, okay? But um, what I would like you to pay attention to is the kind of asymmetric nature of the, um, of the curve on the left. And the reason for that is that as you are driving the torsion in, um, in a chosen direction, your constrained energy minimum ends, well, your your minimized structures get stuck in higher energy local minimum until, for example, you break you break some kind of intramolecular non-bonded interaction, and then now you're in a different local minimum. And the shape of the curve is going to depend on the choice of direction, whereas in the torsion drive, there really is no direction that you're choosing. So um, I would argue that the quality of the result um, is, uh, is better on the, on the right-hand side, okay? Um, and, um, <clears throat> um, and I'd also like to show you an example with a two-dimensional torsion drive. So this, um, so this code, which was originally um, written to only support two-dimensional drives can now support arbitrary number of dimensions. So at least we can do one and two, and some cases even go up to three. And in the case of two, you can first see that a two-dimensional drive contains richer information than a, one, than a pair of one-dimensional drives does. And it also shows you that if you perform this a uh, unidirectional, or I guess you could call this a bidirectional <laughs> scan, in, in, a, in geometric alone, that you do end up with some of these uh, getting stuck in these high energy local minima indicated by the red regions here. Whereas if you use torsion drives wavefront propagation, um, you, you, do spend a you do spend a factor of four more in, uh, in terms of CPU time, but you uncover the, um, the local minima that were previously pinned, right? Um, plus you end up with a more reproducible result. Um, so, um, so I, so I think that is, uh, um, so, the, so these tools are basically in place. So assuming that you have the molecule and you have the torsions that you want to scan, um, the integration of these, uh, these four tools, um, including the QC archive that Daniel will, tell, will later tell you about, um, should, uh, um, should be able to generate this data for you, you know, using um, pretty much completely, uh, completely open source means, okay?
Um, and um, and now I uh, now I hand off the, the mic to Haya, who will um, will tell you more about the molecular fragmentation. Um, hi, I'm Haya Stern. I'm a graduate student in John Kadera's lab, and I will talk to you. Wait. Oh, okay. Um, and I will talk to you about um, some of my work on fragmenting molecules and um, and you know different aspects of the torsion drive pipeline. So um, before we start fragmenting molecules um, and driving the torsions, we want to um, enumerate protonation and tautomeric states of these molecules. Now, why do we want to do that? Um, first of all, um, most molecules exist in equilibrium of different protonation states. Um, and another reason is that different protonation states will change the, the torsion profile of certain bonds. So um, it's important for us to enumerate it. Now, currently, um, I'm using OpenEye to enumerate these states, and it, it does introduce some um, unreasonable states. And um, because of the way the torsion profile, um, sorry, because of the way the torsion pipeline is working, we do do an AM1 calculation. So that does filter out many of the unreasonable states. It is a pretty expensive filter. Um, we are working with Marcus Veter in a, a postdoc in our lab on a more efficient way of um, generating reasonable polymer states. Um, okay, now once we have the states we want to um, get torsion parameters for, um, we want to fragment these molecules in such a way that they are that the torsions that we want to drive are computationally um, efficient. So we want fragments that have, you know, one, two to three um, rotatable bonds because um, we want to reduce computational um, cost and also the conformational distribution um, that these molecules have. And we do want some overlap so we can capture um, the, 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 you know, the torsional and the, the configurational distribution of the molecule. Now, what are some pitfalls when you try to fragment molecules? Um, so I'm gonna walk through this example of this biphenyl to um, demonstrate um, what, what we wanna be careful about when we fragment the molecule. So in this biphenyl um, molecule, we're looking at the central rotatable bond. And um, what I'm showing over here is a torsion scan of that central bond. And as you can see, looking at it, this is a rotatable bond um, and you know, you can, it's fully rotatable. Now, as you start, as you take this molecule and generate different protonation states for it, um, the, 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 the torsion profile of that bond changes drastically. Um, so if you look at, is there like a, a way to point? Okay, so um, if we look at the, that's the neutral form, um, you got, I mean, the, the torsion profile looks very similar to the one we saw in the last slide. Um, but then if you have um, the cation here, you see that the barrier heights increase, um, this barrier height decreases, and as you, um, and here you introduce an anion, and this looks closer to a double bond or an aromatic bond, as you, and, it's, and as you go to the um, Zwitter ion, um, this is a totally aromatic bond. And um, if we look at the Viber, oops. if we look at the Viberg bond order, which we calculate um, using AM1, um, you see the Viberg bond order. The Viberg bond order goes from something that's close to um, a single bond to um, 1.5, which is an aromatic um, bond. And the reason, and here I'm just showing that the reason why um, this Witter ion here is, um, you know, has has a bond order of 1.5 is because it's actually conjugated, it's part of the conjugate, extended conjugated system. Um, now, most chemi-informatics tools, if you're gonna be cutting, you know, um, rotatable bonds, it will not, it will label this as a rotatable bond and you would think that you can, um, that you can fragment that. Um, now here I'm, sh so the, 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 the important point of that is that you can have changes, you can have substituents far, far away from the, from the rotatable bond that you're looking at that can change the electronic property of the bond, yes? Um, 
Um, on the previous slide, how are you choosing your QM functional for these calculations? Um, so for this one, I used um, B3LIP and um, was it, it was, I think, I think it was the total um, basis sets. And um, so, so currently the, the, the level of theory that we're using for QM, um, we're basing it on the benchmark study that was done by um, the Genentech scientists that they showed that you know, B3LIP is actually pretty good. I'm just wondering, because in my very limited experience with quantum, it seems like protonation states can also change like which function best describes things. And so I, just something that I'm wondering about personally a lot. <laughs> and so I was wondering what you'd seen. Thanks. One additional question as well. How are you handling things where you've got parts of a torsion space that are totally inaccessible? Like you can get certain systems where you rotate them, they'll, they'll react, for example, right? So I'm saying when you've got, uh, how do you handle torsions where you can't get a complete torsion profile? Oh, a lot of the time you, you, know, you can get a reaction occur. Right. Right. Yeah, so and, and then you've got to be able to detect whether that happened if you're going to automate this. Right. So I'm um, currently in the in the pipeline. We have two um, in the workflow. We have two different ways of running the torsion scan. So one of it is doing the full rotation, but then we also do these you know constrained scans where certain certain bonds, if they they're like have a bond order of above a certain amount, we only like go like and we don't do like the we don't use the torsion drive what, that does like the waveform propagation. We're just going up. On um, you know the barrier by like you know five to ten degrees. Up. In the case of rearrangements, like what you're concerned about, also I think uh, we're computing the Weiberg bond orders after the calculations as well, so that we can make sure that the bond graph is preserved, and we can then label those or filter those after the fact. Okay. Uh, so you, so you, I, that, so. I was going to say, so you can be sure you're not going into completely well, yeah, wild no, so chemical we, space. We definitely. So I I recalculate the bond orders and re, and use those bond orders to get a chemical graph and then um, check if it matches the initial chemical graph and that will also pick up protons that um that you know migrate. Thanks. Um, so here, what I'm showing is I'm just so currently I'm working on the kinase inhibitor set um, to get started. Um, with this, so I had fragmented them, and then um, these are a little small, but um, so I'm just showing certain, th these are fiber bond orders calculated for these fragments, and I'm showing how different fragments will have, um, you know, different, so this is, this is, you know, some of the fragments of the satinib, and if you look at this bond, Okay, so you know you got a bond order of 1.02 here, and that's 1.17. Now 1.02 is very close to um, a, you know a single bond. 1.17 from like the different um, um, torsion drives that I have done, it's it it's, it it would like it will look different. It, it, maybe the bond, the, maybe the like change in the bond order doesn't look as drastic as um, what it does to the torsions. Um, and if we look at this one here, I thought this was interesting where um, the larger fragment actually had a bond order that was um, much different than, than a smaller fragment. And this, this has to do with how, um, you know, um, substituents further away are either an you know, electron donating and electron um, withdrawing. So depending on which substituents you take away or add on, that can change things um, further away. So what we're trying to do is um, have a fragmentation scheme that will give you fragments that are small enough so that you are not, that, you're, that, that your torsion drives are not terribly expensive. I mean, they're still gonna be expensive, but that, you know, to reduce the computational co um, cost. But at the same time, we don't want to, um, we don't want to, you know, obliterate the, um, the chemistry that we're trying to generate data for. Um, so these are the criteria that we want when we're fragmenting the molecules. Uh, we want to have a, a central rotatable bond. We want all the substituents right next to it because that will give us um, the immediate chemical environment. Uh, but then we also want the correct resonance structure, which is basically we want the correct, um, you know, bond order or the correct, um, you know, electronics in that bond. Um, and then we don't want to go up to like more than one or two or three like Taft's rotatable bond um, for computational um, feasibility. And then, you know, some things we do not want to fragment. We don't want to fragment ring systems, certain functional groups, like a list of functional groups that we don't want to fragment. 
um, we don't want to um, fragment extended pi electron systems. And this is where the Weibach bond order can help us out. So currently we have, um, I have an initial um, fragmentation scheme that um, where you take your molecule, calculate um, the Weibach bond orders using a and calculation, and then using chemioinformatics tools, finding the rotatable bonds. And then once you find the rotatable bonds, you build around it, um, and you, know, you keep the um, rings on certain functional groups. And then once you have those fragments, um, you check the, the bonds that are going to be fragmented now, what's the Weibach bond order on that, right? And um, if it's above a certain threshold, which that threshold is, I'm still optimizing what a threshold should be. Um, you know, we we keep we keep that um, we keep that bond, and you know, you keep on doing that recursively um, until you can fragment your molecule. Um, now, so this algorithm, um, pretty. Thank you. Uh, the Weibach bond order will depend on the geometry, probably pretty strongly. So you do a minimization on the first step as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and I definitely looked at that um, a lot. Um, so for many of the bond, so for the bond orders, the bond orders that are involved in conjugation, that's where there'll be a lot of variance with, um, with, with um, the geometry. For the bond orders that are not really involved in the conjugation, it's actually pretty tight. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean we we do like a but again it's 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 AM one so we it's we're not doing like a full QM um, geometry minimization because that would be too expensive. Um, but the assumption that I'm going on right now, which um, you know still has some limitations, is that because it's the bond orders that are conjugated that have higher variance, I should be able to pick that up without doing a geometry optimization. Well, somehow you have to define the structure for which you're calculating the bond orders, and that will be critical in that first step that you actually get a mini. You can minimize at the at the yeah yeah yeah. So level. yeah so so yeah. Of course, I use the the minimal structure, um, like a, a, a like a from from OpenAI. Yeah, yeah, the, the lowest. Min you might still want to do an AM1 like another, mini, another mini AM1 on that. Before a I minimization that. at the AM1 level, I think, would be probably good. Maybe Christopher Bailey can clarify this. Um, we're using his AM1 computed um, uh, Vibrant bond orders, and I believe there is a, a, a geometry optimization performed. Maybe, can you pass the microphone over to Christopher, who could comment on the methodology? Yeah, so um, Hein is looking at some, she's really trying to generalize this um, approach of using the Weiberg bond order to drive these kinds of decisions. I think uh, AM1 is very cheap and you can run it on the, compl on the whole entire small, large small molecule right. before fragmentation. Oh yeah, of course, it, I, yeah, that's what I do. I do and it you could even run it on several different geometries of that as well. So I think... Well, if you're, uh, you, you could do that, but another thing you could do is if you just got the AM1 single points at the various different geometries, then you might be able to more quickly detect when you have this kind of variance of bond order, which flags the kind of bond that you don't want to break. Right, which I had looked at and which, um, which basically showed me that if you're going to have a uh, a, a bond order that you don't want to break. It's yeah, that's where the variance is going to be. Oh. Um, okay. So this um, the above fragmentation. So we want to use the Weibach bond order for. Um, we want to we want to ensure two things. One is we want to ensure that we're not breaking um, conjugated systems. Um, and another thing we want to use the Weibach bond order is that if we have a molecule. If we have a bond that has um, uh, that's highly conjugated, we want to be able to extend out around that central bond to the point where we don't lose that, right? So that's 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 slightly different than just making sure looking at each rotatable bond that you're not fragmenting the conjugated system. So um, this is still a work in progress. Um, so what what I do here is so I have my initial molecule that's um, the satinib. 
uh, where I have the calculated vibric bond orders, and then we did the initial fragmentation scheme, and then we can again recalculate these um, vibric bond orders on the fragments and um, look how, how much they change, right? So um, in this case, it actually changes pretty, um, that's like 1.09 and that's um, 0.99. So that's something that um, I would want to avoid. So then just randomly you add on different, different parts of it um, until you arrive at the bond order that is you know, close within what, the, within what the variance of these bond orders are. And, um, and that's how you um, find the fragments that um, have similar um, torsional profiles as the parent molecule. Um, okay, so this is just um, a little bit of, of, of statistics on the kind of fragments we get out using this scheme. Um, so over here we're looking at the fragmentation of 43 FDA-approved kinase inhibitors. And um, using the initial scheme, we have 295 fragments that we got from those um, 43 molecules. So um, if we look at how many fra fragments each molecule um, produce it, pr produces, most of them are, you know, um, a reasonable, like, you know, between, like, you know, that's the, that's the distribution of it. Um, now, um, within this set, I didn't find that many overlapping fragments between the set. Um, and, um, but this is the, what the distribution of the heavy atoms in the fragments and the, and the amount, the number of rotatable bonds, which, um, you know, in, in this case, most of them have, you know, between one and three um, rotatable bonds. There are a, very few that have four to five um, rotatable bonds, too. Now, in this set over here, I did not expand the states. This was without expanding states. I just took the, um, the, the, you know, the neutral forms and um, fragmented. But then um, when I expanded the states, um, we arrive at you know, around double the amount of fragments. Um, but if we look at the amount of states that get generated, um, we find that many of these fragments actually overlap with each other. So even though we're generating a whole bunch of of more states, we're not generating that, we're only doubling the amount of fragments that we have to actually um, drive the torsions for. And, um, and so, and so uh, looking at it from the you know, expanded states um, for congeneric series, um, we probably will have a lot more overlapping fragments. So the, the, um, the amount of computation that you would need by just adding more to the kind of generic series will not increase that much, um, given that we're gonna be keeping all the data in the database and that data will be reused. Um, so this is just an overview of around how many torsion drives you need for a drug-like molecule using examples of imatinib and misatinib. Um, so the here I'm showing the fragments that are shared among the imatinib and misatinib states. And you know, as you can see with imatinib, you got 16 states, but you only have 15 unique, um, um, unique fragments, and, um, and then you know, the 1D and the 2D torsion drives that we get. So for the 2D um, torsion drives currently, um, what I'm doing is I find the um, rotatable bonds and then just do you know, combinatorial um, the, 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 um, the 2D um, torsion scans because I want to make sure I'm, catching, I'm capturing all the correlations um, between the torsions. Um, there might be a more intelligent ways of doing it so that you don't have to do all of that, you, there might be ways to um, reduce that, but currently um, I'm you know, using a little bit of brute force for this. Um, okay, I think, is that, no, oh. Okay, so now I'll move on to another topic, um, which, so now that we are generating all these fragments and we run the torsion drives, um, we need a way to um, store the data and make it reusable for the entire community. So Daniel Smith will speak about the QC Archive Project, um, that that ensures that, but for the for the for the database, however, we need a way to um, index these molecules such that they are usable for both the for the open force field, cheminformatics, and the QM community. Um, so for that, um, I wrote C miles, which generates these indices for molecules in the QC database. Now, the issues that C miles is trying to address is first of all. Um, when you generate a graph, a chemical graph, the nodes 
the, the, the indices on the nodes are arbitrary. But for the QM calculations that you want to run, your, you know, your XYZ um, matrix cannot be arbitrary. Like it needs to, it needs to the, the order needs to be, needs to be the same every time such that you can find, you know, the matches between them or, you know, to, that they're equivalent. So what we are doing here is we are generating smiles that have these tags. And um, so these tags are the map. So we, we, so the, these tags are the maps, the map indices on these, on the molecules and these map indices correspond to the order in the xyz coordinates and they're also like in cmos there are these you know utility tools that help you regenerate um help you reorder the geometry that you have in that order and like once you know if you have a new a new a new um a new chemical graph it maps it onto the um it helps you map it onto the geometry so that you can always recover the order that you initially submitted to the database so that makes it um you know, that makes it easy to, to recover molecules that you already have. Um, another issue that we have is, you know, these indices need to be the same if we're going to be using them to search, right? But the problem is that you're, most of you are aware that even though um, different packages will call something canonical smiles, they're only canonical within the package and in some cases the package version. So, um, so you know, it, so to ensure that we always get the same indices for you know the data set that we're generating, CMOS pins will pin the toolkit versions, and we will be distributing it as a Docker image such that the, the versions are always pinned to the same version, so we're getting the same canonical smiles. Um, and another, you know, since we were generating these tools, we figured that we also want to have some standardized representation of all tautomers and protomers of of the molecule. Um, so CMOS also does that. Um, I would say it's it's, it's really good to have here. It might not be absolutely crucial right now for the project, but it's, it's, it's a feature that can be very useful if you want to get all the, pro if you want to search the database in the future and get like all the protomers of acetic acid or, um, but the problem with, um, uh, with a standardized representation of the tautomers is that each one that I had looked at still has some limitations and none of them cover everything. Um, there might be other indices that I'm not aware of that people can point me to, but from what I've looked at, you know, I mean, you know, entry is supposed to standardize um, for tautomers, but it, there are certain tautomers, especially like the keto enols, one well known that it doesn't, it doesn't capture that. Um, RDKit also has a new standardization um, um, function, um, but again, it doesn't capture everything. And OpenEye also now has a new standardization function, but there are some also that it doesn't, um, like these ISO indels, indels. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily capture those. Um, I think, so, I mean, currently we have all of these indices in CMOS, um, and I'm, again, working with Marcus to have something that's more robust than these, um, but, in, you know, it's, it's um, I think, a, can be a useful f um, feature in the future. So um, now I'm going to give it over to Daniel, who will tell us about the PC archive. Okay, yeah, any questions? Chem informatics is hard, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. Great, uh, so I'm Daniel Smith. Uh, I am a software scientist at MOLSI, uh, so I'm actually not formally part of the Open Force Field project. I'm actually with a different organization, um, but we have a really nice project called QC Archive, which synergizes very nicely with the requirements of the Open Force Field Consortium. Uh, so we've heard a lot about uh, QC Archive and like what it does. So I actually wanted to walk people uh, through a particular example so we could see exactly how it works, what it does, uh, what are the limitations, and what are the benefits of this kind of approach. Uh, so I should note that QC Archive is much more low level than everything else that we've done so far. So everything is very high. You know, I want to, for example, get a whole bunch of uh, torsion energy surfaces. Well, how is it that we do this? Um, how do we marshal tens of millions of CPU hours and make sure that we never repeat those CPU hours uh, across this project? Uh, so this is after you've fragmented a molecule, uh, after you've done everything, in turn, including preparing its original states, and I'm actually a, wanting to do a single torsion drive on a single molecule, um, or more of a question of not how I only do one of these, but how do I do thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of these? So at the very beginning, uh, 
fragmenter itself will actually say, okay, I finally have a full three-dimensional molecule that I want to run a torsion drive on. Uh, that will be submitted uh, to a central server somewhere uh, from one of our clients, which are Python-based. Uh, these things are also purely REST interfaces, so if you interface them through uh, JavaScript or something else, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, so once you have submitted a, a single uh, quantum chemistry torsion scan, uh, it goes to a client, which finally ends up on the server. Uh, and when it ends up on the server, the server first says, have I ever seen this before? <laughs> and if I've seen it before, I immediately return it. Uh, if it's a new computation, I start up uh, torsion drive itself. Uh, since torsion drive uh, has wavefront propagation, we're not able to immediately fragment this and do massive parallel pair beginning. Uh, so torsion drive is in fact a service where a service is able to make um, very small and very CPU uh, lightweight uh, decisions of exactly what should happen. Um, so in this case, uh, it goes to torsion drive and says, should we start a new wavefront propagation? Are we complete? Um, how many more computations? Uh, so usually torsion drive is going to say, hey, I need uh, maybe 50, 60 ge uh, geometry optimizations. Um, I want you to go out, distribute these um, across not only one local cluster with many nodes, but maybe many local clusters with many nodes. Um, so in this fashion, we're able to aggregate not only a single cluster, but multiple clusters together from multiple PIs, um, or perhaps uh, very interested power users in the community who would like to contribute to the project. Uh, so this can go out to local clusters, supercomputers, AWS, you name it. Uh, we hook into everything um, because these things are effectively embarrassing parallel. You wind up on one of these compute clusters, which will spin up geometric, um, and in this particular case, Psi4, to actually execute the geometry optimization. Uh, these results uh, go through a serialization process, um, go back to the server. Uh, torsion drive is then asked uh, if the result is complete or if we need to compute new results. Uh, and then finally, once this prop uh, process has finished its iterations, uh, torsion drive will say, I'm complete, and it'll shut down. And so the next time the user queries a server, they're able to get this entire torsion drive data back. Uh, and so because this is uh, a bit more asynchronous, um, we usually uh, wait for a, a continuous request. So I need this piece of data. Um, do you have it? Can I give it back to you? Um, if not, should I consider doing it? So this is obviously quite a large software stack that attempts this goal. Uh, so we have a couple different pieces uh, throughout. Um, so the client interface that you might find on your laptop, um, probably underneath fragments for this actually going off querying and asking people to compute, it's called DBC Portal. Uh, we have a central server uh, which will host all of the data and be able to submit um, new computations called DBC Fractal. Um, we actually use a variety of distributed workflow tools depending on your uh, supercomputing cluster or if it's AWS. Um, not, it's not a one-size-fits-all, um, so we're actually able to implement and uh, delegate to any number of these. Uh, then we actually go through a small program called QC Engine. And QC Engine is kind of the heart of everything. We're actually able to take a single representation and farm it out to different QM programs, um, semi-empirical, or things like Torchan if you want, you know, anti-force tools. Um, so we're actually able to run these workflows, um, just changing out two lines uh, in an in input. So if I want to run it with semi-empirical or quantum mechanics, et cetera. So I'm actually very flexible in this particular regard. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we can always go back and we can do different uh, services. So if you, uh, if you don't want to use QC Portal and its client, if you want to have like a web interface or et cetera, um, you can do raw REST calls to the client, I'm sorry, to the server uh, to get this exact same. And so uh, really at the heart of all this is something that we call the, the quantum chemistry schema. And uh, effectively, this is what allows us to go through all these serialization and distribution processes, um, where we have a central schema which does very short descriptions of quantum chemistry molecules, uh, and we're actually able to have many different backends that give us the exact same result back. Um, and what's really nice about this is we're no longer writing ASCII text files, we're no longer parsing ASCII text files. Um, we're going directly to the quantum chemistry codes. We're saying, what are every single quantity that you have? We're serializing that and giving it back. Um, so for example here, um, a lot of times you want just maybe like, what is the energy of a B3 alcohol? Um, and that's usually great, but you know, what if you want to dig into it a little bit? What if you want to go back and get, say, like the dipole moments, the quadrupoles, the Weiberg bond orders? Um, usually this uh, increasingly means that you have to parse this kind of awkward ASCII text file. Um, the schema goes around that, meaning that we have a formal way of getting these objects back. Um, so there's no more parsing, there's no more um, breakage of, of uh, basically ASCII parsing, et cetera. 
Uh, and so this is uh, online now. Um, we're continuously expanding the capabilities of this and the number of codes that hook into the back. Um, so analogous to the schema is we have the quantum chemistry engine. Uh, what this engine does is it takes the schema and applies a single program to it. Um, so in this case, I'm actually able to uh, simply take this task. I can run QC engine, which is a Python program, uh, and get the same result back from, say, uh, Sci4, QChem, and NWChem uh, in the exact same format. So there's no question of how do I parse this thing, how do I get it back, et cetera. Uh, in addition, um, we can also hook into, for example, uh, semi empirical codes if you want. Um, currently, we have Fortiani if you want to run Andy1 to see how well that does for your test set. Um, and we also have things like force fields. So we're actually able to run uh, UFF is one of our first approximations that we use for testing, which is actually just incredibly useful of the whole stack, instead of waiting for quantum mechanics to actually compute. Um, and so we find that you know, this is three orders of magnitude faster, which allows us to develop our software so much faster, which is really helpful. <clears throat> and so I actually wanted to go a little bit um, into the API itself and how a QC portal call would work. Um, so uh, again, this is uh, very low level, so this would actually be inside Fragmenter in general, but if you want to uh, access this project directly, this is often how you would do it. Um, so first of all, you uh, build yourself a client, um, you connect to uh, a website somewhere. Um, and so uh, that website will usually be multi-central server, um, but if you want to have private servers as well, that's perfectly doable. Uh, and the first thing you can do is you can say, list all the cl uh, collections that you have. A collection is very analogous to workflow, uh, except it's very static in nature and usually um, will give you data back in a very specific format um, to the client. Uh, so in this case, we have the open force field workflow that we've been dealing with, uh, working with Haya to create. Uh, and within that, um, it looks like we're dealing with the Kemper project and we are switching between Site 4 and RD Kit Compute, um, basically between testing and production. Uh, there's also uh, other things called data sets, which um, are different kinds of collections, which are much more, um, I guess, tabular in nature. So I have like, you know, a very large number of molecules and I want to compute a single method for them. So there's lots of different types of collections that you can do. Um, so once you look at the collections, uh, in this case, I want to open up the OpenFF workflow. Um, I get the Kemper uh, Sci4 data set back. Um, the Kemper Sci4 data set is about 15 gigabytes at the moment. Um, so obviously you don't want to pull all of this at the same time. Um, instead, what you do is you pull a metadata, an object that you can deal with uh, in Python, um, and pull the data that you're really interested in. Uh, and so, for example, um, and, and like I said, this, this interface is very specific to uh, Fragmenter itself. Uh, and so in this particular case, um, whenever I create the open force field workflow, I've already determined um, all the Fragmenter options, all the RD kit options, and exactly how I want this computer. Um, so once I have done that, I can, I can add new fragments by simply specifying um, what my initial molecule looks like. In this case, it's going to be an ethane fragment. Um, and again, the quantum chemistry schema. Uh, and it's going to go off, submit it to the server, and actually start the cascade compute um, to actually evaluate this in a single line of code. Uh, and so, of course, uh, in this particular um, test set, uh, I think we ran um, perhaps like 134 torsion scans. Um, which resulted in maybe 80,000 QM computations. So this is um, a single job um, out of hundreds that we can add to this. Uh, and uh, we can also pull these results um, back quite easily. Uh, so for example, uh, here, uh, one of the very specific things that we want is we want um, what is the torsion energy profile of this. Um, so instead of having to look at, uh, well, we have torsion drives inside those torsion drives or optimization runs inside those optimization runs or individual um, quantum chemistry computers. So instead of dealing with all that, you can just say, give me the final energies and I can plot um, this directly um, and see what that energy torsion profile uh, was for this particular job. Um, and so I'm able to pull back not all the data, but individual pieces of that data um, very easily um, so that I'm not um, basically hogging huge bandwidth. Uh, and this is a couple of kilobytes versus many gigabytes for and I should note again that within this, within this run, we actually have all the wiper bond orders already there. So uh, I think we're talking about um, what would happen uh, with, if a hydrogen was moving. Well, we have um, exactly, we can go back and pinpoint exactly when that hydrogen moved, where it's at, what happened to it um, via the bond orders. Um, so we have all that data that we can go back and back to. Um, I, I should note too, is that the uh, quantum chemistry archive project is, uh, not just um, about torsion data, it's actually for all kinds of data. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, we're doing torsions, but we also have bond angles and propers uh, within 
uh, the open force field collaboration. Uh, we're also doing uh, electrostatic potential data, um, not quite yet, but definitely very soon. Um, I looks like this was a snapshot before I was quite done with this, so apologize about that. Um, but the other points that I wanted to make real quick is what's nice about the software stack is that if you want to run it on your laptop, you can do so. Um, or if you want to run it in master distributed fashion, you can do so as well. Um, so a lot of times you might want to say, uh, I want to run you know, a torsion drive with any one on my laptop, and that's perfectly feasible with the, quant or with the computation resources available to you. So um, it's incredibly elastic in nature, uh, able to hold small projects all the way up to very large projects underneath the exact same. Um, there's all kinds of other capabilities that I was going to list here, um, but it, basically any kind of quantum chemistry data that you want, um, we can compute it, we can organize it in a fashion um, that's useful for you. Um, and that's effectively what the project is really aimed at. Um, and I believe that's all I have. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me more about this, please come find me. Questions on the QC archive part? I think this is going to be a fantastic resource for the community and for especially for enabling machine learning. All right, just a couple more slides before lunch. Um, so uh, the last last thing. Oh, yes, please go ahead. Where is that data going to sit? Uh, sorry, currently it's going to sit at TAC, um, the Tech <clears throat> Advanced Computing Center. Um, yeah, and it should be open for anyone. So you just Anyone can pull from that central location. Thank you. I should ask if there's any questions from Zoom as well. All right, uh, so once all that data is, is retrieved, uh, obviously it goes in the first generation into force balance to um, uh, parameterize things. Um, uh, there's an ab initio target, I believe. Maybe, actually, maybe you can just walk us through this slide very briefly. Sure, okay, all right, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go. Uh... Um, I'll go through this a, a little bit quickly because the um, because the final result of a torsion drive is a um, is a set of ab initio of single point energy and gradient calculations that can be directly translated into the um, into the ab initio target type so that force balance can fit uh, force field parameters to reproduce these energies and optionally gradients um, the uh, um, so the automation of data from QC archive into force balance um, that uh, that part still that part still needs to be written, but I think that um, um, but I think that should be pretty straightforward because they are really designed to interact with each other, um, and um, and this and this is already um, and so the use of torsion drive data to parameterize force fields has uh, um, um, has has been done, and I'm definitely not the first. Right, there's just some examples where force balance has been used to do that. Um, the, uh, um, these figures um, you've already seen from from the previous talk, where um, um, where where we were um, where we parameterized force field uh, a force field to reproduce these um, torsional energy profiles for um, for a protein force field on the left, um, and we are currently in the middle of adding parameters for phosphorylated amino acids on the right. Um, so um, um, I, I would like to point your attention. Maybe a little bit closer to the um, to the scatter plot of the QM versus MM energies that, that we have here, and um, and and mainly I'd like to uh, mainly I'd like to show you that in the um, that in the initial scatter plot you have a lot of um, you have a lot of blue points that are below the diagonal line, which means that you have like you have confirmations where molecular mechanics is predicting a lower energy in quantum mechanics, which means that. Um, if you if you run a simulation using the initial parameters, you'll get a wrong equilibrium structure, and that is, I think, first and foremost, the type of problem that reparameterization should correct. So that is why all of the so that's why the confirmations and energies um, in the status set are not equally weighted. Um, we have larger weights for lower energy points, and we also increase the penalty on confirmations where. The molecular mechanics energy is lower than the quantum mechanics energy, so that after a few optimization cycles, you see that the predictions of the force field are not just close to the diagonal line, but mostly above. Um, and um, and and la and lastly, um, even if you have a lot of data, that's not going to completely prevent your force field into going somewhere far away where it is no longer accurate. Okay, so um, um, so so uh, so a good idea is that um, after you fit your parameters, you perform additional molecular mechanics minimizations, and then add this quantum mechanical data as extra targets. Um, and this is basically going to, um, 
Um, this is going to basically root out and remove the appearance of spurious molecular mechanics minima that are far away from your quantum mechanics training data. Um, this wasn't my idea. Um, and so, um, and, and then after doing this for a few cycles, if you no longer encounter spurious molecular mechanics minima, then, um, um, then, then with some reasonable confidence, you can, you can say that the, that the parameters are at least pretty good for this degree of freedom. So that's how we plan to use this data in the, you know, in the short term plan for optimization. Great, thanks so much, Li Feng. Um, so we, uh, after feedback from the October meeting, the virtual meeting, um, we are working on a bespoke torsion fitting tool that will reuse many of the same components, but then run on your laptop or run on a, uh, um, a local computing resources with the idea that for a free energy calculation, for example, you might have a congeneric series that you'd like to generate all the fragments for and parameterize very rapidly to refit high quality torsions. We're hiring somebody to lead this project um, and are working on that right now. And it might be something we talk more about and get some more uh, feedback about your compute environments. We also love input on what compound sets we should prioritize for the, for the first sprint of generating data and fitting for the first improvement of torsion. So uh, that might be a good afternoon discussion topic as well. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, all the folks who's, who spoke and all the folks who have contributed. Um, also, I want to thank the folks at Pfizer for a lot of conversations about the fragmentation schemes that they had used, which very much heavily influenced our fragmentation pipeline. Um, and any questions, I'm happy to answer them, either from Zoom or from the audience here. I just want to thank all the torsion fragmentation <laughs>